Over the break, the Washington Post put out an article that had some interactive visualizations in it. And what it was trying to visualize was uh, how sicknesses can be spread through a community and what some preventative measures uh, can have when we simulate these types of things, such as social distancing. And I saw this simulation where you have uh, these cells effectively, and this is in an, a sick cell. And when the sick cell uh, bumps into another healthy cell, it infects the healthy cell, right? And there's some notion in this model of uh, there being recovered cells as well, um, because after some amount of time being sick, you recover. And so just by simply moving these cells around in a 2D space and checking for when they collide with one another, uh, the interaction is able to model uh, sort of through stochastic randomness uh, what the curve of healthy and sick looks like. And I thought, you know, we it would probably be a little bit too much in 110 to try and go through um, some of this, these graphing techniques. But one of the things we could do is model in our uh, code pretty simply, and it actually works with objects very well, uh, this notion of cells, which when they run into one another can infect one another. And so what we're going to do in this next hands-on is write some code in today's lecture uh, that will model uh, how when cells run into one another and each of these cells will be an individual object stored in an array uh, and what some of their properties will be, what is the point they're stored at, what is the direction they're moving in and whether or not they're sick. And we'll write some code and evaluate some code that's been provided as sort of starter code uh, to model this such that we can try some different parameters as well. So let's say we wanted to try a thousand, uh, a thousand cells, we can see a, a much different uh, rate of outbreak when the density goes up like this, right? To get going with these exercises, you'll want to run npm run poll and then npm start in your terminal like we've gotten used to this semester. And you're going to see a lecture 15 directory with a number of files in it. And the files that we'll be concerned with are only the cell.ts and model.ts. Uh, those are the, the core data files where our objects and the logic of our model will live. Uh, but I wanna just quickly move you through some of the other files that we're seeing here, just so you know what's in this directory. So uh, the visualization.html file, this is where uh, we set up the web uh, page. We're using a technology called the an HTML canvas. This is where we're drawing our graphics. Uh, and then there's some buttons for playing and pausing uh, the text input field for the number of cells that we're simulating. And then the velocity of each cell is here. Uh, the script that actually has our main function is the visualization-script.ts. This is where main is. And you'll notice that it sets up a model uh, and the default model has 100 cells in it by default and the velocity is 0.1. Uh, we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Uh, the view is what's going to update, the, the view class is where our logic for updating the graphics will be. And we're not gonna get too hung up on this because uh, the, the graphics mode of working with a canvas is a little different than what we did in class uh, before. And the details are really outside the scope of Comp 110. The controller is a class that responds to inputs, right? So if I just very quickly looked at the view class, you could see that it has some properties. Uh, this render method is where we're updating based on the locations of cells. We're filling in you know, red for sick cells and white for uh, regular cells. We're using arcs to draw the circles. Uh, but all of this is really just support code so that we can start from a point of having some working graphics that, that you really don't need to worry about. And the controller class, similarly, you don't need to worry about this, but just to give you a brief overview of what you're looking at, uh, what we're seeing here is when you press, say, the reset button, we're clearing our, any output in a, in a console, we are resetting our model, we're, we're calling the view render to update one more time, and we're stopping uh, if, if, if our animation was previously stopped, we're, we're playing the simulation from that point. So it's resetting that simulation. Uh, but again, the controller is a class that's uh, dedicated to when you press a button, what do you want to have happen? Uh, and that logic gets hooked up between it and the view.
the three classes that we really care about and that you uh, should, should concern yourself with are the point class. And this is actually a class that we implemented uh, a few lectures ago. A point has an x, y, it's a Cartesian uh, coordinates point, uh, it has x, y properties. And just like we saw before, there are some translate methods. Uh, we've added an add with method that you're gonna make use of in just a little bit. Uh, and so it's worth taking a read of that. We're going to see that in order to figure out if two points collide with one another, or if two cells collide with one another, uh, we need to know how far apart they are. And if they're close enough, that means they've collided. The two real important classes for today's example are model and cell, right? And so model is going to be the class that keeps track of well, how many cells are in our simulation, what is the velocity, uh, you can see the constructor that we used from our script to, to, to generate a new model. And one of your first tasks that's in grade scope uh, in the, the, the activity for today's lecture is to read through this reset method and get a sense for what it's doing. Notice that it's making use of two methods and the direction of a given cell is when we update the position of a cell, uh, by what offsets do we update it? And so just to briefly explain the math here, notice we're picking a random direction, uh, some random amount. So math.random returns to us a number between zero and one. Uh, so let's say it's like 0 0.5 multiplied by two pi, that would give us just regular pi. Uh, and then we're calculating uh, some the, the x component and the y component using a little bit of trigonometry uh, and finally multiplying that component by our velocity and this is how much we're going to update a given cell's position by uh, and we're, we're just generating this at random and so you're going to want to think through and describe what's going on in English in this reset method. Uh, in just a bit we're going to come back and implement this tick method uh, but you'll also want to read through enforce bounds and convince yourself you understand what this method is. Write a little bit of English to, to describe it. And lastly, this check collisions method. So those are the three methods I want you to write some English descriptions about and just read through them, know what they do, right? Once we have a sense of this, we're gonna change our focus and, and be working with a cell. And this is an individual object that each dot on our screen is going to be modeled by, right? And so each cell is gonna be made up of a location, which is a point and a direction, which uh, it feels a little bit confusing to think of this as a point, but think of this as an offset X and Y that we're going to update our location by each time we want to change the position of a cell as it's moving around in our model. Each cell is gonna have a sickness property and when the cell's sickness property is zero, that's not infected. If it's greater than zero, so if it's one, they are infected, right? So we're going to have a method on the cell class that is get sick. All it's doing is assigning the sickness property one. So this is sort of like a little helper method that we could say, hey, cell dot to get sick uh, to make our code read a little bit more straightforward and hide the detail of how this cell class is modeling sickness, right? So someone using this class doesn't need to know about these numbers necessarily. Those are for internal purposes, right? We'll have some more implementation work to do here as well. So you should go ahead and pause the video and try reading through and typing through what you think in English reset enforce bounds and check collisions are about, and then we'll resume back here in another 10 seconds or so. Okay, great. I'm glad you were able to figure out that reset is effectively just setting up a new world with however many cells our model is supposed to have in it and initializing their location and direction, uh, adding them to an array. And then we're setting up the very first cell in the population to be the sick one that we seed our, our simulation with. And then enforce bounds is just checking, hey, is this cell still within the bounds of um, the, the simulation? And if not, what we're gonna do is we're going to set it
uh, to be moving in the opposite direction depending on which bound it hit uh, and being sure it doesn't go escape those bounds. And then check collisions is going through uh, starting from the front of the array of cells uh, and comparing each cell with every other cell, seeing if the distance between those two cells is less than two. And if so, we're seeing that cell A is going to collide with cell B. Notice there's a little bit of cleverness here to reduce the overall number of comparisons, uh, but this is still going to lead to a large number of comparisons uh, between cells as, as our simulation grows larger. This isn't the most efficient way of doing this, but uh, this nested loop at least gets the job done in comparing uh, how far apart every two cells in our simulation are from one another, and if they're close enough, we'll collide them. Right? So what we're gonna do next is try and get our simulation actually in motion. And one of the common strategies that we saw even in the game of life is this idea that we can, um, on given time intervals, update a model. And the classical name or the, the, the idiomatic name for a method to update at each time step of some simulation is the, having a tick function, or in this case, a um, method. And so our tick method on the model is gonna be called by our controller 60 times per second. So 60 times per second, we're gonna try and update our screen so that we get a very smooth animation. And each time we tick in the model, what we wanna do is also tick in each one of our cells. And the tick of a cell is going to try and update its location. So what I'd like you to do is let's go ahead and try implementing the tick method, which is uh, in described in part one here, and the prompt is given to you in the, in the code. So your goal is to define a void method named tick that has no parameters. And what you're gonna try and do is reassign the location based on adding the current location to direction, right, of this particular cell object. So you're gonna to need to read the location property, you're going to need to add, add it with the direction property, and then reassign the result of that back to location. In order to do so, you might wanna take a closer look at the add with method in point. So notice that this is a method on the point class, which each of these two properties are, and you can add one point with another point and uh, I'll let you read through this code as well as trying to define and implement part one on your own. You can go ahead and pause the video at this point and we'll come back and implement it together once you feel like you've got it. So if we're going to define a method, we give the method name and then the list of parameters. In this case, there are no parameters, so we're going to follow this with the return type. Remember, the syntax of a method is a little bit different from a function. We don't put the let keyword in front of it, and we don't have an arrow between the return type and the uh, body of the function. And so the point of this particular tick method is to update the location of the cell. So each time, remember 60 times per second, we're going to try and update the location of the cell to move it along some path and we're gonna move it in the direction point that it's, that it's been set up to move in. So the way that we can do that is we can say this dot direction add with this dot location. Right? Now, if we go and we look at the add with function, or sorry, the add with method of point, we'll see that it returns a new point object. And so what we need to do, if we wanna update this location, is say this location is going to be replaced with this dot direction add with this location. Now, because addition is uh, commutative, we can make that operation happen in either direction. We could have also written this as this dot location add with this dot direction, right? And this actually probably reads a little bit better. What we're saying here is we're going to update the location of this cell by taking the current location of the cell and adding it with a direction, right? And this direction, remember, is just gonna be a little offset 
uh, that's going to stay constant until it runs into some bounds. And that when we run into the bounds, as you saw in the check bounds method, it will cause the direction to flip. And uh, it will appear as though the cell is bounced off that side of the screen. Okay, so we've implemented this method in cell. Now we actually need to have our models tick method go through and call that method on each and every one of the cells in our population. So remember, the model has a property named population that is an array of cells. And so in tick, your first goal, don't worry about either of these two uh, to-dos, but your first goal is to go ahead and loop through the population and call each cell's tick method, right? So loop through every cell in the population property of this model, right? So this population property is here, and uh, write a for loop to do that. Inside that for loop, you'll call the tick method on each and every one of those cell objects. And then once you see those cells moving on your screen, you can go ahead and try taking care of to-dos number one and two. Once again, if you wanna pause the video at this point, we can come back and talk through it in just a few more minutes. All right, great. So if we want to loop through every cell in our population, we can set up a for loop, let i be zero, while i is less than this dot population is the array of all of the cells in our simulation dot length, right? And i plus plus to increment i by one each time. And we've got a few different options for how we want to call the cells tick method. One option is just to say this dot population at index i, this would be referencing a particular object in our array of cells. And we could call the method on it directly here. So dot tick would cause that method to be called, right? And so we can try this out. And so we can try this out. Remember to save your code in VS Code and then if you jump over to your browser and refresh it, you should see your cells moving around. But you'll notice we have a particular problem. Uh, our cells are, are moving off the screen. And notice that if we give it enough time, we'll have none on our screen at all. So we really want those bounds of this model to be enforced uh, in some way to be sure our cells don't all escape, right? So I'm gonna switch back over to VS Code and before we, remember you had already read this method, enforce bounds, before we enforce the bounds for each cell in our model, uh, what I first wanna do is try rewriting this uh, uh, for loop in just one subtle way, right? So one of the strategies that's typically handy when you're writing a loop in this way is to say, okay, let's go ahead and set up a variable. Let's, I might name cell, that is this dot population at index i, right? So we're setting up a local variable inside of this for loop. And now what I can say is cell.tick, right? Instead of having to say this.population at index i. And so I've just rewritten this very slightly. Uh, but now what we can do is we can use this word cell to say this.enforce bounds and pass it a reference to that cell. So notice the method you read through earlier checks the location of a given cell and make sure it's within bounds and, and fixes its direction and position if it's not, uh, we're gonna call that method on every single cell in our population as well. So I'm gonna save this code. And now what I'm gonna do is refresh. And we can see that our cells are bouncing off the bounds of our model as we would expect. So it would seem as if uh, we are enforcing those bounds correctly. So that's pretty great. Uh, this seems to be doing what we hoped it would. Now there is one last to do in this tick, uh, which was we want to, after we've updated the positions of all of our cells, we want to check whether or not any are colliding with one another. So we need to call the models check collisions method. So we can go see well, the, the signature of this method is just an empty parameter list, it's void. And since we're already working within the model class, if we wanted to call that on the same model, we would say this.checkcollisions, 
right? And so now every time we update our screen, first we update all of the positions of our cells, and then we go and we see whether or not any have collided. So at this point, I can get rid of my to-dos. And let's go think about check collisions for just one more moment, right? So here, what we're saying is, if two cells are close enough to one another, we want cell A's collide with method to be called and be given, reference, given a reference to cell B, right? So let's go look at the collide with method. And you'll notice here uh, that the collide with method is still unimplemented. And there's this other method named isSick, which has some work that needs to be done as well. So for this next hands-on, before we worry about the collision logic, uh, I'd like you to try first implementing this isSick logic. You can do this in one line of code. You don't need to use an if statement. And I would challenge you to try and do that here. And the way that you'll know that this is working is if there are any sick cells, when you view your model uh, or your simulation, you would see that cell highlighted in red, right? So go ahead and pause the video here. Try implementing the instructions of part number two and resume once you have a red cell showing up in your simulation. Okay, so if you want to implement the logic where we return true if this object sickness property is greater than zero and false other otherwise, one of the things we can do is just say return this dot sickness greater than zero, right? And so if sickness is greater than zero, this will evaluate to true and this method call would return true. If it does not, then it would return false. So if we now go refresh our uh, simulation, you'll see that here is that one sick cell that is floating around in our model, right? And so the last thing that we need to do here to get this to work is we need to implement this collision logic, right? So this collision logic says if this cell that the method collide with is being called on, so that would be the this variable, if this cell is sick and the other cell is not sick, then you should make the other cell sick by calling other dot gets sick, right? So uh, here we're saying uh, when the model, remember when we are checking our collisions, if two cells are close to uh, enough to one another at any given update, uh, this method will be called and this will be one of the cells and other will be the other. Uh, you'll wanna be sure that that logic is true in reverse as well, right? So that if the other cell is sick and this cell is not, then this, cell will get sick by calling its get sick method. So go ahead and spend a few minutes seeing if you can implement that logic uh, through an if then else if statement and using the appropriate method calls to express that logic. Once you have this working, you should be able to see that when two six, when one sick cell collides with a healthy cell, uh, that the healthy cell would become infected as well. Okay, so let's try this together. So our logic here is if this cell is sick, so if this dot is sick, and that's a method, so we call if this dot is sick, and the other cell isn't, so and other is sick, uh, but I forgot to include the not symbol, so and the other is not sick, then what we will do is say other dot gets sick, right? So if this cell is sick, meaning its sickness property is greater than zero, and the other is not, that would mean that it was equal to zero uh, or less than, then what happens is the other cell is going to get sick, right? And so get sick will cause the other cell's sickness property to become one. Right? So there's another case here that's important, which is else if the other cell is sick and this cell is not sick, right? In which case, this cell should get sick, okay? And so now if we reopen that, uh, simulation and I refresh, 
and we watch our sick cell. We're waiting for it to collide with one other cell. So far, so good. Uh, and then notice that as these cells start colliding into one another, it infects the cells around them. And if you wanted to stress test this a little bit, you could increase this to say a thousand cells and reset. And we'll see that uh, wherever your random sick cell began, it will start infecting those around it. And so in this demo, what you worked through were the implementations of some methods. And what I want to remind you of and, and, and have you reflect upon here is that this model is a class that contains many objects of type cell, right? So it, the model has a population that's a cell array. And when we reset it, we're randomizing and shuffling where these cells are located, what directions they're in, and which one is the sick one. Uh, each time this screen updates, so every time one of these, uh, every time this screen updates, which happens about 60 times a second, uh, this tick method is called. Right? And it's pretty incredible that this, all of the logic here for moving through each of our population cells, calling that cell's tick method, which remember you implemented that to be, take the current location, add it with the direction that the cell is moving in, and then make that the new location. So that's what caused our cell to move around, right? Uh, and then what we're doing is we're enforcing the bounds. So there was some logic that was provided to you, uh, but each cell then is checked, hey, are you potentially out of bounds? And if so, we're gonna move you in the opposite direction, right? So if your X was less than zero, if you're about to go off the X axis, we're going to set your X back to zero, but then change your direction so that you're uh, the direction you're moving in along the x-axis is inverse, so it's like you're bouncing in the other direction. The same with y and along the other side of the bounds. Right? And then we check for collisions. And this collisions for double for loop here is going through and comparing each of the two cells in our population and, and trying to discern whether one is close enough to the other to collide with it. And if that is the case, then we call this collide with method. And you just implemented the logic for it, which if one cell is sick and the other isn't, we, we infect the other cell. So hopefully you can see some of the, the powers of uh, object-oriented programming and having some uh, properties, have spawning, uh, you know, in this case, a thousand cells and updating them, manipulating them in simple ways, using some straightforward logic uh, to implement the rules of some simulation to have some uh, effect. And we can use this to build tools that uh, are very similar to the ones that you saw on the WashingtonPost.com website. This type of simulation is actually how, uh, this is, is a sort of a simplified form of this, the simulations that you would see uh, in the real world in labs trying to uh, predict the outcomes of certain phenomena. As you add more properties, you could you could imagine ways that we could expand this particular uh, simulation to be uh, more reflective of certain real life scenarios and properties.